Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I can probably assume that while there may be some people in this audience who are really fantastic at doing future planning, I suspect that there may be a few, my suspicion is the majority, but I'm happy to be proved wrong, who maybe aren't quite that great uh, at planning when it comes to their own lives. I was incredibly privileged to interview uh, Daniel Kahneman, who some of you may know uh, is the behavioural economist who won the Nobel Prize for economics, and he's just this fabulous, incredibly smart man. And um, his, his point was that generally people just ignore the future and they sort of abandon uh, rationality, especially when it matters. And I think that that's something that a lot of people can identify with. It's much easier to make a small decision to think about what sandwich to buy than to think about, well, actually, where will I be in five years' time? What will my job like? Will I have one at all? And in general, when people are sort of forced to think about and to address how they see the future, they tend to fall into, I think, two broad camps. You get some people who are pretty optimistic. It's kind of people, the top of the picture represents their idea of the future. It's kind of all going to work out. Technology will sort everything. Those fabulous pictures of the future that they came up with in the 1950s, where it was all flying cars and everybody got on, and it was all kind of pastel coloured and marvellous. And um, they think that is what the future is going to look like. And there's also lots of people who, if they do think about it, they kind of realise, actually, it's just dreadful. We're all going to hell in a handbasket, and you know, thank goodness probably won't be around to have to deal with the hideousness that's, that's about to come. Um, but as I say, most people don't really think about the future because it's incredibly difficult to address because there's so much uncertainty, and it's much easier to face the here and now. Now, there are some people, of course, for whom the future is very certain. They may have a sense that, well, it's actually predetermined. So if you think, for example, that there are some people, I don't know if we've got any in the audience today, who have a very certain idea of when the end is coming. Um, they, they, you know, they, they know the end is nigh. Not only do they know it's nigh, they also know the time and the date. That they are incredibly certain. I always wonder about these people. That, uh, are they really that sure? Do they maybe take you know, a tasty snack just in case? just in case they get it wrong and they get hungry and the world, the world is still going. Um, but they have a very certain sense that the, the world is predetermined and therefore it can be predicted. Now, I, I don't think this is true. I think the future is not predetermined and therefore trying to predict and pronounce with certainty and insist that it's accurate is foolish. We, we don't know what is going to happen, but what we can do is try and come up with some kind of sensible model for getting as close as possible to where we think things are likely to go and accept that there may be different scenarios, things may turn out differently, so perhaps we should consider more than one possible future. So there's also a question, how far in advance? We talk about the future and it's kind of vague. Are we talking about one year, five years, ten years? And what I find very interesting in doing this for businesses is that, in general, different sectors tend to have a very different mindset when it comes to how far in advance they tend to look. So there's uh, a reason why Shell, uh, the oil company, who is recognised as the pioneer of a particular technique called scenario planning, because they have to think uh, 50, even 100 years in advance. If they're going to build an oil platform or something uh, which is going to have to have a return on investment 20 years from now, 50 years from now, they really need to look ahead. And so that's why, as a, as a whole, that sector tends to have a very far-reaching mindset. Now, you compare that to retail, for example, um, if you're building a new retail store, the life of a store is maybe 10, 15 years, so you have to look that far in advance because you want it still to be working in 10 to 15 years' time. But most of the time, retailers aren't having to look that far ahead. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes talk about the idea that it's uh, even thinking beyond next week, you know, is quite, is quite a challenge. But there's actually a very good reason for that. Uh, because if you are a retailer, then you can experiment, you can try things out on the shop floor if it doesn't work straight away, you can take it back and, and, and rearrange and have another go. So there, there are structural reasons why different sectors have these different kind of 
time frames. The other thing, of course, is that the further out you look, the more uncertain it gets. Uncertainty kind of accumulates. So you start to get to a point, if you're looking 50 to 100 years in advance, uh, which is not something that, that we do, we tend to look 5 to 10 years, stuff starts to get very, very tricky. And you start to have to question, well, what are the real fundamental human, human values, human drivers, I can assume, will still be the case. We're still going to have to eat. And we'll probably have some kind of social element. But it's difficult to get much, much beyond that. Because it is certain that we are living through a period of change, a period through of great change. And at the moment, disruption is, is very fashionable. So if you look at uh, business book titles at the moment, you can see um, Alan Greenspan, The Age of Turbulence, The Age of uh, Disruption. Um, Philip Kotler, who's a big marketing guru, he's written something called Chaotics. And, it, and it's all changing, and it's all terribly confusing. And how on earth do we deal with all of it? And I think it's quite helpful and instructive to remember that this anxiety, this sense that things are changing <coughs> incredibly fast, isn't, isn't a new thing in itself. This concern that are we going to be able to adapt has been around for an awfully long time. So I don't know how many of you are aware, but uh, when the bicycle was first invented, there was a genuine fear that the human body was not designed to go at such speeds. Mm -hmm. And if you went on a bicycle, you could get a permanent physical disfigurement, which was bicycle face. <laughs> and, and, and it was permanent. It was un <laughs> nothing you could do about it. In fact, it's not true. Anybody who's not been on a bicycle because they're worried about bicycle face, it's not true. Um, but I think it kind of shows the extent to which this new stuff makes people worried. It makes people anxious. You have people who are incredibly able in their working lives to be accountable and objective. And yet something happens when it comes to their personal lives. And for some reason, this, this rationality sort of gets, gets put in second place. And I think that there are times and places in our personal lives where it can really be quite useful. And the particular place where I think it's useful is in future planning. And the way that we can get there is by trying, at certain times and certain places, to cultivate the objectivity that we get to without thinking when it comes to our, to our working lives and see if we can apply it to our personal lives. It's, uh, it, it can be difficult, but I think it's, it's, it's worth, worth a go. And the thing I think that often trips people up when it comes to thinking about the future is that understanding of what we can and can't control. And one of the, um, I suppose, questions I have about some traditional self-help is that it's very internally focused and doesn't always take into account some of the external factors which can also have an enormous impact uh, on our lives. So this is where I get to this, this slightly random, well, it's not random, but this perhaps surprising, surprising thing about pesto is not, of course, the, the tasty sauce, but um, stands for political, economic, social, and technological organizational factors. And it doesn't have to be pesto. Sometimes there's a C added on there to stand for commercial. Sometimes uh, you know it's steep. There's two E's, an extra E for environmental. And it doesn't really matter what the acronym is. I think what's important is the mindset about uh, opening up and really trying to take uh, a wide view. So it might be quite extreme, but it's not inconceivable that an oil price rise uh, might make it too expensive for a couple living apart to live to, live to visit each other. So sometimes some of these enormous macro factors, you can start to see a logical thread that might impact somebody on a more personal level. We took lots of people through the methodology to test it, to see, does, does this thing work? Does it hold up? And we've written up some of them as uh, case studies. And it was absolutely amazing. It was, it was quite fascinating. It was ostensibly a, a rational process, which it is. It's about trying to make this as rational and logical and coherent as possible. But actually, what it does is it starts to sort of reveal and deconstruct and help us understand some of the emotional drivers that we may not be aware of. So somebody had an ostensibly very simple decision about whether or not to get a dog. And it turned out, actually, the kind of things they needed to consider to make this decision sensibly went from everything from their social life to where they should live to their, you know, whether or not they might be able to find a partner. All sorts of much bigger parts of their lives were, were being influenced by this or could, could be influenced by this one decision. <coughs> And to take another example, 
uh, there was somebody who was trying to work out whether or not to rent her house out and go traveling. And when she came in, all she was talking about was property prices, because that's the kind of stuff we're, we're allowed to talk about. We understand that that's very sensible, property prices going up and down. And then when we took her through the process, it, it revealed to, to, to our surprise, as much as hers, that actually uh, it wasn't about uh, property prices at all. Um, the thing she was really struggling with and that was making her not want to think about the future was a question as to whether her children were going to accept her new identity as a reinvented single person. Um, so it was, it was really quite, quite far from the initial question, but by pursuing a rational process, we can actually understand our emotions a bit better. There's an interesting sort of uh, optimum point of objectivity we have when we try and go to our friends for advice, which is that if somebody doesn't know us well enough or they don't know us at all, they can come up with suggestions or stuff that's too impersonal, that doesn't really make sense for us. But conversely, if they know us really well, you know, I'm thinking maybe of a, a parent or a close family member, then they think they know what's good for you. And actually, that, that's not always that helpful either. So it's about finding an optimum point of objectivity. And if you can, find somebody else who can possibly help you think through this decision, possibly with a futurescaping process or any other process that you need um, that can help you get, get to a decision. And the last thing is to encourage people to, to look outside, to think about, and not just because it's interesting, but because it's so incredibly useful to consider what are the different factors that may be affecting our personal futures, possibly in the employment sphere. Maybe there's particular companies that, that you think might be impacting the company you're working for. Uh, maybe the sector's changing, but could also be uh, in the emotional sphere as well. So, you know, the question nowadays is no longer to get married or not, but to get married at all. Um, you know, it's not just about who, who the partner might be. There's all sorts of really enormous and interesting changes that are going on that may factor into our personal lives. And it's worth just considering um, rather than just going through life and just letting stuff happen. So I suppose if, if there was just one thing um, that I'd really like to emphasize about the future, that it's not really, in my view, about being right, uh, but it's really about trying to be ready. Thank you. I'm coming at it from a slightly different perspective, having worked in futures and used the traditional methodology. And I think it's true to say that when we used it in government, we never thought of the obvious, could one use this in one's personal life? But when we did do futuring in government, and, and Tamar didn't explain in great detail the technique because, because the, the actual true traditional futures technique is, is quite complex, but when we used to do futurescaping in government, and when we look back over the big systemic shocks that had happened sort of the previous decade, all too often one couldn't have predicted the future because of these things called wild cards that came out of left field. So the scenarios that you would have predicted 10 years previously would never have were not the ones that, that actually came to pass. So I guess my question to you is, if we use futurescaping in our personal lives, how do you deal with these wild cards that will suddenly come out of left field and just couldn't have been predicted? What's interesting about wild cards is how what is taken into traditional futures uh, practice changes over time. So for example, before 9-11, uh, the idea of some kind of terrorist attack that, that would fell uh, a key building was not something that, that, that would be considered when you're doing futures. After 9-11, suddenly that became a possibility. I think the way, to, the way to deal with it is to try and focus on what are you sure of, what, what is likely to be a continuity. So rather than fixating on what this particular subversive thing might be, is to say, well, is it possible that there will be political, economic, some kind of revolution that will destabilize to the point where um, something happens that you need to plan for. So for, for example, if you're doing, uh, having done some futures work for uh, a big retail, thinking about distribution, the thing we, th the wild card we thought about was what if um, there was a SARS or, or avian flu that would have a, a profound impact on, on the supply chain to the point where maybe we couldn't get things from A to B. Now, it might not be avian flu, it might be something quite different. So it almost doesn't matter what, what is in the, the, the content of the wild card, but we need to think about 
uh, what might the impact be on whatever it is we're addressing and therefore how would we deal with that so we can rehearse and be a bit more prepared. You are essentially taking a methodology that traditionally has been used in the business sector. And in, in these times at the moment with all the failures we've seen in recent years, is that the best context from which to take something to then use in our personal lives? Well, I, I, think, I think that's, uh, that, that, that's a very good question. Um, however, I agree that at the moment, you know, business is not, uh, is not really uh, in favour right now in general, you know, banks especially. Um, but I think that amidst all the, um, all, all the terrible things that people are saying about them and the fact that, that there have been some you know, profound uh, failures, Nonetheless, there are a lot of companies, some of them many, many years old, many decades old, who are performing incredibly well. So we have uh, lots of businesses that are highly functional, that maybe are not getting the press attention because we don't even think about it, that are delivering um, products and services you know, daily, minutely to largely satisfied customers. Some companies have done terrible things, people in these companies, but there are lots of companies who are doing really well, and what can we learn from them?